might be curious about what I'm actually wearing here. And what I got here is something that you might even call rocket science. And it's a technology that can change people's lives. But before I tell you why and how, I would love to share a memory with you. When I was a child, I went to this water theme park with my family. And they had this main attraction that was a super long and super uh, yeah, steep water slide called the free fall. I was only seven or eight years old, so of course I was absolutely not allowed to go on it. But I was, however, allowed to follow my big brother up and watch him as he went down. So my parents were standing on the ground with their you know, old school video camera. And in this recording, you can hear them go, OK, so where's Rob been, my, my big brother? OK, yeah, there he is. But wait a second, is that Sophie? What is she doing? And then two scared parents holding their breath as I throw myself out the water slide with a big smile just to immediately come down and ask if I could do it again. Today, I'm here to share with you how I kept on throwing myself down water slide after water slide and pushed the field of robotics into something new and even more exciting through my company, Tendo. When you look back, you can often find situations that have been crucial for your journey forward. One of those moments for me was when I decided to believe enough in an ID that I had to actually send an email to NASA. I just asked them for support to come to Houston and uh, work on a project of mine. And I can tell you all that my heart probably skipped a beat when I got this reply. I think I took the computer under my arm. I ran to the kitchen to my friend, just shoved it in her face, saying, oh my god, I'm going to NASA. Or more specifically, I probably said, I'm going back to NASA. Because it was not the first time that I've been in contact with them. During my master degree program to become an industrial designer at Lund University, I got the opportunity to participate in a research course in Houston. The mission? Get man to Mars. So quite a challenge. They're still working on that one. Uh, my interest laid within how the human body would be more prepared for long, long, distance, long distance space travel. And I decided to focus myself to the hands. My first concept sketch looked like this, and it was a tendon-driven, motor-powered hand exoskeleton, or a robotic glove. It could give the astronauts uh, artificial strength as well as a resistance. The strength was used to give them a boost uh, when you land on Mars or go on a spacewalk, and the resistance was used to maintain your mus muscles active, even when you are in microgravity. So, when I had this concept in mind, I thought to myself, what if I would bring this back to Earth? I have family members with rheumatic diseases, so I could clearly see the connection between what happens to the astronauts up in space, what happens to about 5% of the Western world's population. And I mean, if nothing else, at least there's a bigger target group, so that's good for business, at least so far. Today, I'm very happy that I did send that email to NASA. Because, uh, since then, my team and I have created a minimalistic assistive robotic technology. It can assist the user in gripping, holding, and releasing objects. It works quite similar, actually, to the body itself. When I was young, I noticed that when I pressed my arm here, my fingers started to twitch a bit, like magic. But it wasn't magic, it's actually that when you press your arm, your tendons shorten a bit, and that makes your finger move. And this was the memory that came to mind when I was working on this concept. However, it wouldn't be so good to walk around and press people's arms, so instead, I created artificial tendons outside of the hand, trying to mimic the body. My first concept looked like this, and it was straws that I taped to my fingers, and I had elastic bands, and when I pulled them like this, the hand closed, and when I had it on the back, I pulled it open, and it also gave a good resistance, the exercise. The product that I'm wearing still works in a quite similar way, actually. However, it's not straws that keeps the tendons in place. It's a textile glove. And I'm not the one doing the pulling of the wires. The actuator system and the control unit are. This control unit is placed on the user's arm, and it contains, except for the actuators, uh, sensors, batteries, uh, electronics, and it weighs less than 200 grams. We have created a patented technology that assists the user to maintain the strength in the grip 
without having the runners run the entire time, which makes it less energy consuming, which as a result leads to smaller batteries and a smaller product. The user can control it intuitively with non-invasive biometric sensors. And these smart sensors can feel the body's own intended movement and respond to a signal that the body itself does not respond to, which is a pretty revolutionary system for human-robotic interaction. The beauty of this technology is that it can be applied to so much more than just the hands. We can create the same concept for a leg, a foot, a shoulder, an arm, and here is where my big vision comes in. Because this means that we can make everyday life accessible for more people living with a physical disability. It means that we have the opportunity to include more people into the society once again. For all of us, it can be quite hard to imagine what life would look like if your body did not function in the same way as it does today. In my work, I often meet people who are paralyzed in almost their entire body due to a spinal cord injury. What, how it actually affects their everyday life, of course, differs from person to person, but something I often hear is that you're basically never alone. You are locked to your personal assistant all the time. Your life changes drastically, you feel like you're interrupting the dinner because you need to ask someone before you have a glass of water. You watch your partner run around with your kids, you're running late, and you became frustrated because you're not able to help in the way you want to. There's about 12,000 people in only Sweden and Denmark and Norway living with a spinal cord injury, and the majority were under 30 years old at the time of the accident, and the impact on everyday life is huge. The injury is often connected to obstacles to social and economic inclusion, and it has a global unemployment rate on over 60%, according to World Health Organization. We can all imagine that there are some functions that you miss more than others. Many might think that it's the ability to walk, but actually that comes quite far down on the wish list. What always comes highest on all studies we've been through is hand function to be able to grip, to be able to do everyday activities like eating, drinking, brushing your teeth, getting by by yourself. But despite of this, options that do not include another physical person or complex surgeries are very limited. But this is what we are working to change. During this journey, I've often been met with raised eyebrows and concerned skeptical faces when I say that I'm creating advanced medical exoskeletons for people with a spinal cord injury, and I think their eyes open up even wider when I answer the follow-up question if I studied medicine or biomechanics with the reply, nope, I'm a designer. I started this business alone, in a field where I had absolutely no experience. I didn't have any savings in my bank account and no experience of actually running a business. And of course, you know, that was a little bit scary, but the idea of never even trying felt much, much worse. Within the first 10 to 12 months, my co-founders had joined me, and let me tell you, they took quite a deep, uh, deep dive right from the start, because we decided to apply for a startup program here in Denmark. And on one of the last final stages of the application, they told us that you need to show a functional prototype to be able to be accepted, and we said, yeah, of course, no problem. There was just one little problem. Uh, we did not have a functional prototype. And now we only had two weeks to complete one. So we spent all minutes of the day we could together. We were working day and night, and then 30 seconds before the presentation, we were still working on it, actually, but 10 seconds before the meeting started, it worked. Close call, but we got accepted. And the program we got accepted to was Odense Robotics Startup Hub. My team and I packed our lives together in a car. We moved from Sweden, where we're from, to Denmark. We spent almost two years here. We moved to a small apartment together, really living the startup life. And in addition to pitching, network events, developing, the startup life for us meant to do a whole lot of research. We have been involving the user from moment zero. We have been asking all the difficult questions, trying to understand not only how we can maximize the function of a person, but also minimize the feeling of being limited. 
We meet users all the time that have seen or tried medical robotic solutions, but who would never wear them. Why? It's simply not made for them. It's big, sometimes ugly, uh, bulky devices that takes forever to learn, a long time to put on, and are often just used in industrial, in industrial environments or at hospitals. By incorporating the user's voice, we are creating a product that's not only user-friendly, but user-worthy, which is a word that one of our users said that just really stuck to us. We are changing the word exoskeleton from meaning this big, bulky machine to becoming a slim, wearable, tech, and that's easy to use, easy to put on, and easy to learn. It's been described by medical experts as the first exoskeleton that makes sense. There's one particular user that has been helping us a lot, and uh, we're calling him Yuan, and I would love to share his story. When he was about 20 years old, he dove into shallow water, he landed badly, and he broke his neck. His life changed in a split second as he became paralyzed in almost his entire body. And today he needs help with everything. From getting out of bed, to go to the bathroom, getting dressed, brushing your teeth, preparing food, packing up your things. And he even has to ask for help before he can have a sip of water. His independence is extremely limited and he is in some ways excluded from the society. But we met him, and he tried our product. And within 10 seconds, he could drink, he could draw, he could eat by himself for the first time in over 20 years. He could go to a dinner party, he could pick up a glass of wine, he could put it down, he could change to a fork, he could do everything in the way he wanted to with his control and his pace, and that was such a liberation for him. We are ranked as the top robotic startup in Europe. We have received several awards, and in, in October this year, we were in Japan, where we presented our technology, and were selected out of 700, 700 applicants from all over the world to present it at our branches world organization. It's been an incredible, incredible journey. But it hasn't always been just good. Well, not for me personally, in any way. Today, I'm standing here before you on this amazing, amazing stage. I'm traveling the world, I'm leading my company forward with confidence. But a few years ago, I was only a shadow of the person that I am today. In my early 20s, I was uh, completely burned out and I was isolated to my apartment. I had social anxiety, low self-esteem, and I, all the little energy I had, I spent it on making sure that no one in my surrounding knew about it. I had a self-hatred that affected all my relationships, and I even had the trouble talking to people. Not because of the discussions, but because I could just not stand to be in my own body, and that was all my mind could focus on. I really, really thought that everyone was thinking the same horrible things about me that I was, which made interactions with other people very, very challenging. Life continued in this kind of gray way, and my way of dealing with it was simply to hide behind other people, to take down all the mirrors I had in my apartment, and to just avoid my reflection as I passed by windows. But you know, that didn't help much against the internal voices. So the self-loathing became the new more normal until maybe 2014, when I crashed into a complete burnout. But as it turns out, this crash became a very important turning point of my life. Because with it came the fact that I had to slow down. I had to start to accept myself, allow myself to make mistakes. And this created some kind of beautiful mental space for creativity. And in this bubble is where Tendo, my company, was born. And that was the start of this incredible journey. Of course, my whole perception of myself did just not suddenly change overnight. And in the beginning, everything was so scary to go to network events, of course, talking to people, and God forbid to stand on a stage. <laughs> I spent the hours before my first presentation throwing up at the bathroom because I was so nervous. I remember still quite a few network events. I walked out my office. I was going to go. I started to walk down those stairs, but, you know, then I turned back in again and closed the door. Okay, maybe not today. But, you know, that was okay because it was my company. 
It was my pace. But I finally did make it down those stairs. And I'm very glad that I did, because one of the first person I talked to encouraged me to participate in a business ID competition. And guess what? I won. Things like this gave me the confidence, the energy, to continue one more day, and then one more day after that. And there and then I decided to put my company's interest before my fears, even if that would meant that I would feel horrified doing it. Because now, suddenly, it was not just about me anymore. Because with the visibility came the calls, the messages from people who wanted a better life, who have heard about my product and were now asking me for help to get a better quality of life. In the beginning, I had to say no to a lot of people because my technology was not there yet and that really broke my heart. So instead, I made myself say yes to everything. I said, yes, of course. And I decided to create my own luck because if I go to a thousand events, at least one of them is going to pay off, right? And I just continued to once again throw myself out of water slide after water slide until I got enough positive feedback, enough joy, enough confidence, and it wasn't that horrifying anymore. There were people out there who needed the technology I was working on, an exoskeleton that would give them back their independence and their strength. But what all of them did not know was that they were actually the ones who gave me the strength back. So from the days when you pop champagnes to the other days when you lie on the floor cry, as it is in a startup, they were the ones who kept me going, and they were all my personal exoskeletons. Thank you for listening. Thank you.